Well hello and welcome or welcome back to Read Becca. And the lighting I realize is pretty terrible. It's been dark and stormy this week so I'm doing the best I can. I've got every light in the house on. <laughs> so uh, hopefully it holds up at least this this bit. Um, but you are here for books. We're here to catch up on my week in reading, everything that I read, everything I'm currently reading, and everything I'm looking forward to reading. And I had a, a great series of finishes this week. I'm still feeling like my currently reading pile is a bit of a mountain to climb, but that is all right. So uh, let's talk quickly through the first couple books. I don't have a ton to say about. The first one is The Thick and the Lean. I did finish that this week and I have already talked about it. I did a standalone review and I, I really loved it. Um, this is, I think, the second book out from Toronto Porter and it is very speculative, a little sci-fi, but it feels like it's a pretty tangible, realistic world. However, it takes the lens of uh, religious purity culture being about food. And it doesn't just focus on that. We have multiple character perspectives and they're each kind of exploring different topics about how these morals and uh, different aspects of our identity really are socially pressured and have a lot to do with social construction. So I think that was a really great critique on how these restrictions can be really negative. These um, sort of moral moral consensus, even when it is um, strong within a social group, may be such a detriment to people's lives and freedoms. So I thought it was great. It also had some wonderful commentary about um, things like the environment and, and corporations and was, was just fantastic how it kind of tackled so many wide varied topics. So go check out my standalone review if you're interested in that one. The second book I read was Redwall, and uh, this is kind of exactly what you would expect. If you've read the back of the book, you you know what happens pretty much. Um, and that's actually a theme really with this week's books. So the same for the other two books I have to talk about. But uh, this one is, of course, about Redwall Abbey, which is inhabited by mice. And uh, so these, these mouse monks live there and, of, of course, are all good guys. And then the evil one-eyed rat Clooney comes and storms and sieges the, the abbey. And I thought that was all it was going to be about, but it's much more about this sort of series of small adventures and conflicts. And there's some pretty big drama and actually a lot of gruesome violence in here. I was really surprised by how much there is in there, but uh, <laughs> so we're much more on like the the little foibles that Clooney has with his minions that are sort of other other evil animals. I, I don't know that I love how the animals were sort of grouped up into what you would deem sort of obvious evil, like the rats are all evil, obviously, the snakes are all evil, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, maybe that was a nitpick that I have. But uh, it's, it's much more about like the little dramas they have, about the mice befriending other types of animals, maybe they wouldn't normally <laughs> in this situation where they're under threat, the kind of to and fro <laughs> running about to deal with this situation when they're under threat, all of that. There's also this big riddle that the mice are trying to solve during <laughs> all of this time they're under threat uh, to try and like help themselves out. And this riddle is all to do with their, their big hero, Martin the warrior, who was a hero of ages past sort of thing, very iconic. And our, our main character, um, Matthias, is like just just moons over <laughs> this hero and wants to be uh, like emulating him. And so him and um, the, the kind of elderly monk in the, this place go on this, this quest to solve the riddle really about, about Martin the Warrior. So that was probably actually the biggest point of the story, more so than the siege that's going on and all the threat, I think. But it was just, yeah, it was very quick moving. It Because it's moving through these little adventures and conflicts so much, it really has a good pace. So I can see why this works well for kids a lot. Um, I also loved the food descriptions. Everybody mentions it, but I, I have to bring it up. I love that it's not that food is focused on in a major way. It's just sort of there in the background that it, meals are really described. And I think that led to making this feel very cozy. It has definite cozy vibes that everyone kind of talks about, but it's not a cozy book. <laughs> Definitely gruesome action, a lot of adventure. Um, yeah, yeah, 
So it was great. I really enjoyed this. It's a fun middle grade and I will definitely be continuing on with the series. Then I uh, read actually on audio, uh, The Siren Queen by Nevo. And I think, I think I only have one more of Nevo's books to read actually, um, Chosen and Beautiful. And otherwise I have read all of them and liked all of them. So I did very much enjoy this. And this one is again, one that if you've read the back of it, you kind of know exactly what's gonna happen. This is golden age Hollywood. We're following this young girl initially from her very first steps into a cinema to see her first movie and how she becomes enamored with that. And that she's a, a Chinese American girl who, you know, has the sort of stereotypical experience, but wants to break out. She wants to be sort of free of the pressures that are put on her by her sort of her social role. And so she has this, this girl escapes from the, the laundry that her family runs to take these sort of jaunts out every couple of weeks to work bit parts. And she, she becomes an extra as this child actress. And um, not anything, like no big name, nothing like picks up, but she keeps doing it for years and years and is able to get by and make that space for herself. Um, and her, her family tolerates it because she's bringing in money, um, even though it's there's a lot of negative stigma about what she's doing from them. So she and her sister also sort of create a relationship where she enables her sister to get away a little bit um, through this. But eventually, as she's in her getting into her older teens, uh, she does start to move toward what can I do to make this really serious? What can I do to get major roles and start making a name for myself? And she starts to move even further away from her family um, emotionally and moving more and more into the Hollywood world. And in order to make this happen for herself, because she is a, a minority woman, she knows that she's not going to have the options and availability that, that some other actresses will, and she needs to really stand up for herself and she's going to have to go out and take this. And in order to do that, she makes a deal trading years of her life for success, basically, for a, an assurance that she will get in the door, that sort of foot in the door moment. And she, she gets that. Um, she makes her demands about not wanting to represent what usually is the case with minority roles. She doesn't want to play the token character. And that leaves her with monster roles. So she becomes this famous siren character of the title. Uh, and I think that's most of what I would say about the plot. It's very wrapped up in, in old Hollywood and the glamour and showing the gritty background of that. So, so we, all of that, everything you would sort of envision surrounding the setting, the mundane day-to-day -day life on sets in old Hollywood, uh, that that all I think is is pretty expectable uh, in terms of going into this. What I think is really innovative here is how much it, it comments on the power structures and the challenges of these marginalized women because um, she, as soon as she gets into this position, she goes to live in a dorm with other women where they're actually putting them through school to learn how to behave and um, learn to dance. And, all of that supplementary information about doing their job and being the right kind of person. There are very literal monsters there though. Other women who are there have had to sort of hide or even change how they appear in order to get by and, and continue their roles. And yet those women are not given monster roles. And I loved that sort of commentary on something we even see a lot still today where where marginalized characters don't get to be represented by actors who share their community in that marginalized identity. And that's such a, a big thing that's just in there in the subtext almost. It's not, it's not really put forward strongly as a theme, but that element has so much to say to me. Um, so I think this is full of moments that are like that, where we're going through a mostly mundane. There's not a whole lot that is like big action and drama in this. So kind of the opposite of Redwall. It's very much just living out the day-to-day -day boring, miserable life of being an actress and trying to 
search for success and, and doing everything that you can. Um, this also does have a major sapphic element. So I think that played out, it's not, like romance is not a strong aspect of this, but the relationships, the connections with women who are not just people she's romantically interested in, but, but all the support structure surrounding women's relationships is so well handled in this book. So I think those aspects, those really minor elements are what are focused in on. Um, the things about her day to day life as being a Chinese American and the way that people perceive her is a, really a strength of this and getting that, that across is done so well. So yeah, so I maybe had more to say about this than I thought. The last book that I read this week to wrap up for you is Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. If you somehow don't know what this is about, this was all over booktube last year and I think the hype is well warranted for this but it is a super mundane novel. So I'm really surprised at how much this sort of took book two by storm. Uh, this is another one where if you've read the synopsis, you know exactly the plot, basically. Uh, it's very slow moving, no that happens. It's very introspective. Uh, so we are following two women who are married, obviously, and one of them went under the sea in a submarine uh, for their work, for this sort of strange shadowy place, the center, and we don't get a lot of answers about things, definitely. It's not about plot or about uh, anything to do with the actual act of what was going on under the sea at all. Uh, we are more exploring the relationship between the two of them and how this thing that happened has changed that. And it's, it's very much a Leah went under the ocean and came back wrong and now Miri, her wife, is processing. Um, so <laughs> from there I would say this is really about either the end of a relationship or dealing with the loss of a partner in some way, whether that's the end of a relationship or death maybe. Uh, so I love the way that this, in such a quiet story, signposted everything about how that was progressing and just the way it's told because we alternate between their perspectives but everything about Mary's perspective is so focused on Leah and she gets increasingly caught up in these sort of mundane and futile tasks that she's doing that are all about Leah and about just basically like kind of keeping her at the center of her day-to-day. -day. Um, something as simple as her making these calls to try and reach the center and eventually she kind of doesn't even expect to get through to them like she's trying to get through constantly and never really can reach anyone and she just accepts that <laughs> but it's still part of her day to go about this task that she doesn't even really have a reason for anymore um it's it's things like that little day-to-day -day items that she goes through the motions of and everything about her perspective is totally centered on processing what's what's gone on with Leah, um, on all the little things she has to do and think about that are unexpected with Leah's behavior, and her thinking back on how they were before. Meanwhile, when we switch to Leah's perspective, it's all just her looking back on what happened under the sea, her preparing to go and then being there and then things going wrong. And so her complete focus is on this, this event that happened in her life and fundamentally changed her rather than on anything about Miri. Um, and there's a great quote that I think kind of sums it up very well. I love going into the cinema when it's still light and then coming out in the dark. It makes me think about the way a city is never the same. I mean, the way everything changes. Every night, every minute, it's over and things will never be the same again. And I think that encapsulates so much about what this book is doing. It's talking about how changeable we are, how you can be in a relationship and love someone and still fundamentally change as a person and move away from them. And I think that is such a powerful message. And there are moments as well when, when Mia is thinking about things down below in the water um, where she early on is filing away memories of or stories of what's happened down there uh, because she wants to share those aspects of her experiences with Mary when she gets 
that. So she's thinking about how she's going to tell Neri the, the stories of what's gone on or what hasn't really gone on uh, down there. And in the end, you know, we, we learn over the course of the story like that, that never really happened. She never shared any of that with her partner. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting introspective book. It's very internal. I think we can see in Miri's perspective the ways that Leah being so different begins to grate on her and she can't understand um, what has changed so much or why she won't do anything about it. You don't have to worry, she would say, and then go on bleeding. And the obviousness of the problem combined with the refusal of help left me at first frustrated and subsequently rather resentful. It went on too long and too ho helplessly. The way that anyone who sneezes more than four times abruptly loses the sympathy of an audience. So it was with me and Leah. Can't you stop it? I'd think about asking her. You're ruining the sheets. Some mornings I'd want to accuse her of doing it on purpose, and then I'd look away, set my mouth into another shape, and pour the coffee, think about going for a run. So the ways that we, when we recognize these fundamental changes, we just keep moving forward. And it reminds me of this great quote by Ursula Le Guin, obviously I adore, uh, that something like, I'm not, this is not verbatim, uh, but it's something like, uh, love is like bread. It's made new every morning, remade all the time. And that's, that's what this is all about. <laughs> this is about how when they stop working together and, and remaking the, the bread of their love, uh, they, they do grow apart. And yeah, I think this was just a beautiful book. I, I really loved everything about reading it. And um, I, yeah, I, I, I can see why it rose to all the hype on booktube. So I really will be looking forward to checking out her previous short story collection. I think Salt Slow, Salt and Slow, uh, something like that. Uh, but I've seen it around and I, I do really want to pick it up. So that is it for what I read. And as usual, my what I am reading pile is literally two feet tall. I'm not joking, this has gotten out of hand. <laughs> Lowest priority, we've got Tales from Gavigan's Bar and Byzantium. So those are still on the currently reading, but not really making any progress. And then we have Best of World SF by Livy Tadar. Not by, edited by <laughs> Livy Tadar. And I only have one story left in this and it'll be finished, big chunky one that's been going on for months. So that's exciting. Uh, so I will be finishing up that last story after I get done filming this. <laughs> And uh, then we've got my two that I'm midway through that I've already shown before. So I have nothing really to say about Spear Cuts Through Water or Babel. I did order my own copy of this though. So um, this is a new release that has lots of holds on it. I'm expecting it's going to need to go back. I'm halfway through and very much enjoying it. So as I said, I ordered it from the UK, from Blackwells, because I do like the UK cover better than the US cover, the one with the silver black letters. And so I've ordered a couple other books that are UK specific editions or only available in the UK. So I'll be doing a haul, whatever that gets in. Um, and then, yeah, uh, my new starts this week. I've got The Mountain in the Sea by Ray Naylor and Laura Dane Grace's memoir. And my first Japanese phrases. Uh, this one I was expecting to be a much quicker read, but I'm really taking my time and going through uh, like two pages a day and I'm liking it so far. It's, it's great. Lots of little, little phrases to read through and learn. So that is all that I'm reading. <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, I also actually, my audio, I did pick up Oleander's Sword after I finished Siren Queen. So I'm working on the audio of Oleander's Sword, which is the follow-up to Jasmine Throne that I read and really enjoyed like a month ago. So glad to be continuing on with the series as per my goals this year. Um, yeah, so that is it for books. And watching stuff, I did watch a lot <laughs> this week, weirdly, or I finished a lot of shows that I have going on, I should say that more. Uh, so I finished Love is Blind season four, obviously the live show debacle <laughs> happened this week. And I, I have enjoyed this whole season. Um, it was an interesting one. It feels like there was a lot more editing and producing manipulation of the show. And so I'm not sure I loved that, but it was very exciting to see who ended up together and who stayed together. Uh, so I, I don't want to spoil that for anybody, but yeah, yeah, it was really enjoyable. Um, I also finished up 
Shadow and Bone season two. Uh, it was great. I really enjoyed it. It was very explosive in the end. And I have, I've been surprised how much I've enjoyed this series. Uh, there's a lot of drama to it, but it's not kind of as angsty as I expected. So maybe that's kind of pulling away from the angst of the books, maybe, uh, with the show. But it, it has, like, season one and season two both have really pushed me toward wanting to pick up the books. So I think that may be in my future. Not in the media future. I have a lot going on, obviously, to read. But maybe when I'm a little more caught up this year, I could definitely see picking up Shadow and Bone. Uh, what else did I watch? Oh, fabulous, fabulous movie. I almost forgot. Promising Young, young Woman. I know everyone has seen this. I'm so late to the party, but... I was, I, it was not on streaming anywhere, and my library had like a hundred holes to get through. So, so I finally was able to watch it. It was on Freebie, and watched it. Really, it's like one of the best movies I have seen in a very long time. Uh, it's just so well executed of following this young woman who went through clearly a traumatic um, sexual assault, and now is like going after these men who are willing to take advantage of a woman who's drunk. And seeing how that plays out, seeing her emotional and mental state um, and the way things go in the end, it's just such a well-crafted film. Uh, and not only the performance of the main character, all the side characters, even the men's roles are really well acted. Um, they got some some pretty big names as these sleazy guys and they're played out like totally believable. Um, oh sorry, <laughs> Red Flake's shaking the camera. Um, yeah, so the guys are really well executed that you can understand why somebody would empathize with them, but it also gets across how gross they are. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I thought it was a fabulous, fabulous movie. So no surprise, Hype Train is real. <laughs> Um, what else? Uh, that is it, I think, for watching stuff. So, on the front of life things, I had a disappointing week life-wise. Uh, other than the fact that it was very stormy this week, I'm sure I'll have some footage to throw in. Uh, spring in the Midwest, it, it's always very stormy. Uh, but that meant not really being able to get outside very much, which is always a bummer. Um, and I also went to the orthodontics, and that was my other disappointing thing. I for some reason had gotten it in my mind that my carriers, the metal bars on my teeth, were coming out this week and uh, was wrong. So I, I don't know why I had thought it was this appointment. It's not. So disappointing, definitely, but I'm happy to have them, them in as long as they need to stay in to get things right. So uh, yeah, I just was looking forward to the relief of not having chunks of metal in my mouth. Um, uh, otherwise, I think I have said it before and I will say it again, like, there's a lot of scary stuff going on in the world, in my state, um, and that is, is kind of getting to me, but the thing I have said repeatedly is that, you know, I, I do kind of have to feel hopeful about things and that a lot of what's happening right now with really massive conflicts are that kind of a, a death gasp of sort of aggressive ideas that are falling out of favor and are not going to continue on for much longer, I don't think. Uh, so it's very painful <laughs> right now, and it's kind of getting to me how much, so generally just world happenings, not anything that's personally affecting me, but all of that stuff is, is getting to me. And that has meant, like, I'm feeling a little more down. My reading obviously has been great, but being in the emotional space and sort of suppressed, I guess, emotionally feeling and energy is really drained by that. Work was also very stressful, so that drains energy. That has meant videos, videos editing and dealing with comments all are like the first thing to go when I'm feeling in that headspace. So just for awareness, not that any of you particularly care or are going to get upset about it, but yeah, it has meant much more like flexible schedule of, of dealing with videos or just skipping filming entirely. That combined with the weather being awful and it being dark all the time has meant it's not great for filming anyway. So when I do feel like feeling, filming, 
I often really can't because there's just not enough light. So it's been a week and things are chaos as always. But but yeah, I will continue to make videos. <laughs> and if I'm ignoring your comments, it's not because I hate you. Uh, it's just because I just only have energy at certain times and I will get to you eventually, I promise. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So that is my, my general update. I think, I think that's it. Uh, my recommendations this week. I only have one for you. I'm as always terribly behind, so you may have seen this already. If you are subscribed to Mindy's Magpie Reads, if you're not, you should go over and subscribe right, right away because she is absolutely fantastic, very broad reader, who I recommend often. So uh, Lindy did a list of children's books, picture books for adults. And these are sort of a, a mixture for the Picture This Readathon going on for adults to read more picture books. And these are centered around all ages appropriate books that adults will maybe get more out of, that have kind of more nuanced messages, and things that are maybe takes on children's picture books that are specifically geared toward adults, probably because they have swearing. Um, and I really enjoyed seeing that selection, um, a wide variety of things, and it reminded me of some books I have meant to pick up but have not, like Goodnight Lab has been on my radar to try. Uh, so I do want to check out a couple of those books. So as always, I love, love Lindy and uh, really enjoyed this one. So definitely go check out that video. And I think that's it for me today. Uh, hopefully that's all I have. Um, I'm going to be jumping into my reading. I've been reading very slowly, but I'm really enjoying everything I'm reading. So yeah, uh, we will try to tackle some of my giant TBR pile. Um, I do think that uh, coming out this week, I will have a couple of videos. I don't know yet if I'm going to do a May TBR. I need to think on whether I want to do just a catch up month or if I still want sort of a pile of possibilities. How do you deal with that when you just have so much on the um, like active pile that maybe you don't want to set up more more goals for yourself to tackle? And I mean, I know I will read a lot, but do I want a TBR or not? So I think that is it for me today. Thank you so much for watching. We're in the basement because there's a tornado siren going off. I doubt you can hear it. The cats are being good. Huh. Well behaved, kitties. Everybody came to the basement so compliantly. plants back out and the birds are super happy about it. I don't think this oh what are we doing? Are you thinking about a wheel? Mm -hmm. A wheelie time? Was very good. Nice sprint. Yeah, you did it. Good job. Another pouring rainy day. Spring in the Midwest. 